Welcome to uh, this presentation that I've called Considerations when designing a data visualization. So what I'll be doing here is I'll cover some of the theoretical basic rules for what is a good data visualization. Um, and I'll be using sort of going back in this and finding what were the main guidelines that we can follow. Remember that there are guidelines that you can choose to break them but it's always some good f thing to have something to start with and then you can work from there. So what is a good data visualization? Well, there's different text bibles on this. If you wish. Um, these are some of my favorite. So um, Jacques Petit it has um, a French book, which luckily has been um, translated to English and uh, is unavailable and is repress. Um, it's back way back from um, 67 um, and it's all about um, which variables or channels do we have in um, graphic communication and what are the, what, what are the characteristics of them. Um, Tufti um, has um, also a lot of interesting literature and is really probably one of those most influential um, people when talking about modern visualizations. Um, one of his, amongst many things he talks about, is this thing about optimizing the data ink ratio. And I'll cover that later. Cleveland and McGill, um, what, what they did is that um, they tried to measure um, how efficient different ways of communication was. So visualizing the same uh, data in different ways and then asking a big herd of people to say okay how much bigger is this and that and then comparing the results from this using that to say okay how do we best communicate how do we most precisely communicate data and finally um, McEnlaw, um has um, uh, uh, what he did was that he wanted to make a automatic process for generating visualizations and as pro in part of this process he um, formulated some of the rules for what was a good visualization and broke, breaking them down into this expressiveness and efficientness that we have talked about in earlier videos. But before we do this we will probably have to take a um, little detour and then talk a little about color. Um, color can be described in many ways. Um, on a monitor, on a computer monitor, we typically use R, G, B, red, green and blue color. So we have three channels that we then um, use to present the colors on the monitor. Um, printers, they use SMIC, so cyan, magenta, yellow and black. Um, so um, Smith colors is what the, co the printer uses. So if you have programs that are designed to generate correct prints, they will probably use Smith colors as their way of doing it. Um, many of the Adobe suites, they have something that called lab colors, which is um, a way of simulating a human sight. So it's, it, it's especially good for, for um, for optimizing photos and things like that um, and to you find it in in InDesign and Photoshop and some of these applications and finally in, um, in many mapping applications and on also some spreadsheets in different places we find this hue saturation of value or hue saturation and lightness or hue saturation and brightness different names for the same thing so basically we have a hue, which is a color wheel, so that's what you might call the color. We have the saturation, so how saturated is the color, and then we have how much light is present. So you know, if it's dark, all the colors are the same black. If they're flooded with light, all the colors are the same white. And then in between those two values, we have different um, colors. So. Hue value and saturation is a good way of visualizing 
or working with colors if you want to use it to do data-driven colors. And that's probably why we find it in this type of applications. Um, and then finally, of course, um, these are all about continuous colors. We can also have well-defined color schemes that we can work with. So we're not up defining our own individual color, but working with a specific color scheme. There's a series of these color schemes. Um, we can have discrete color schemes. So a series of colors uh, that we'll use for categories. Um, important here is that the color should be typical for its name. So if there's a, something that is yellow, it should be what we normally call yellow. Um, pink should be pink, mauve, and so on. Um, there's lots of problems you know, because different groups, different gen sexes, they talk about colors using different words. Um, so when trying to find a discrete color scheme, try and find colors that are easy to distinguish and are typical for their name. So when we talk about it, we uh, agree on what is the blue color on our uh, visualization. Continuous color schemes, so that they, um, what they do is that they have some form of, of um, use for measures, so elevation, height, weight, uh, income, so on. Um, when working with these, um, what's important to think of is that are they linear? So is a, um, a change in, uh, in the underlying data of 10%, is that also a change in the color of 10%? And there's some problems on this. Um, we can look at some of the different types. One of them is this classical um, spectrum. So it's just like the rainbow, if you wish, going from mauve or blue, light green, yellow, and red. If you look and see at the red area, the red area is a relatively large and constantly red area on this scale, on this spectrum color scheme. While if we look around, take the same distance, the same size as is occupied by the red, and look in the area around the green, yellow color, you will find, you will find a range going from almost blue to red within that same range. So these spectrum colors, you have to be really careful with them because they have a tendency to blur a lot of information in the red and emphasize variations in the yellow and blue areas. To compensate for this, there's lots of uh, color schemes that just use two colors, we call them bifocal. So in this case, going from blue to yellow. So, and they are typically the more uh, even, so that the same length or chip variation in data also gives a similar variation in color. Um, there's variations in this. We can have a bifocal going over white, so going from red over white to blue um, as, as an output. Oh, again, there, it's always, yeah, this might be good, if those colors can be associated with something so socialistic, liberal, whatever. Um, but you know, red is not really more than blue. So what's the high and what's the low value there? That might be a bit of a problem. So if you have this type of data with a high and a low, you might consider using a monochrome hue. So a single, a single hue value and then just variation over the saturation. So in that case, it's more obvious what is that there is a scale in it from less blue to more blue. So there's lots of things to consider when choosing your color scheme. And um, remember that we have these discrete ones or we can the continuous ones. Um, there is a, um, there's a website called uh, Color Brewer where you can go in and, and try some different color schemes and you can also test them for how do they work with people different forms of color blindness and things like that so this color brewer is a, a good place to you know look at some different color schemes and work with them good so if we go now start with the first of these bibles in, in visualization namely um, uh, Bertin's um, symbology of graphics um, where it talks about these 
different visible variables. So this illustration here is what he identifies as the visual variables. Those things or channels, they're also sometimes called, that we can use to describe our data variations. Um, the X and Y coordinates, so the location, the position, is of course one of the most important ones. You know, if something is up in the, in the top right corner, it's more than something that's down in the le bottom left. So location or position in a coordinate system is probably the most efficient one. We um, can talk about the shape of things. We can talk about the size of things. So I'm using size of variations. We can use the value, as in human value and saturation. So how much of the color is present. We can use textures, so patterns if you wish. We can use the color hue, so what we often would call the color. And finally, we can talk about the orientation, so the direction. Um, orientation is one of those that are a wee bit limited in, uh, in what we can use it for. So all these variables have different characteristics. Um, so, um, and that governs how we can use them. Um, we have uh, selective, so can, if we want to show data where we can extract a object from the others, distinguish it from the other ones, we talk about this selective. We can talk about them as associative, so all, identify all of the same, so difference between for finding the capital or finding, seeing, visualizing all the churches. Order, so how can we visualize order that something is more than something else? Or in too many quantities, so where we can measure how much more it is than something else. So these um, are the main characteristics of them. And there's different things on them. There's an important property of each of these characteristics, namely what it calls the length. So how many different values or steps can be distinguished? How many different colors can we have? Or how many different shapes can we have? Or how many different sizes can we have? So that's what we call the length. So we can now combine all those variables with all of these characteristics and we'll get something at a table like this. So what it says is that position is good for basically everything. We can use it for uh, selective, associative, quantitative, order, and the length is infinitive. It can be any value, basically. Size can also be used for almost all of these things. But typically, you know, we, if you're going to be able to distinguish, so look up in the legend and find it in our map, we should, probably shouldn't go over five different sizes. Um, and if you're going to be able to distinguish them internally in them,